Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining me. Um, my name is Laura Eding. I'm an assistant professor at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. And today I'm going to talk briefly on encephalopathy and neurologic trajectory in AGS. Um, this is a topic that, as a neurologist, is really important to me. Um, but it's a little hard to talk about in this kind of meeting. So please join us for the question and answer session where you can um, ask me direct questions and I'm happy to answer whatever I can. Um, I think in AGS, children have been identified as being affected um, based on their neurologic symptoms, right? They present to a neurologist. And so we have a really clear understanding to some degree on how AGS affects the brain in children. In the original studies that looked at AGS and found it, it was a series of beautiful papers that came out um, quite a while ago looking at how AGS looked like uh, an infection. And so um, there's a type of infections or a group of infections that can happen in utero, meaning when moms are pregnant, called torch infections. And they're named for the different organisms that cause these infections. And it was originally described as being a pseudo-torch infection, meaning it looked like the parents were, the mom was infected and that affected the baby's brain, but it was running in families, which just didn't make sense. And so it's this really clever paper by Jean Icardi and Francoise Gutierrez describing how AGS looks like an infection. And so that was the mindset of how AGS affected children and families, is that it was this overall severe um, mimic of congenital infection. And so the original genes that were described and all of the original stories really describe the same picture. It makes sense. It's, it's called ascertainment bias, right? If you think AGS looks like something, you're only going to go looking for it when the clinical story fits that picture. We've started to move in the last five years towards something we call next generation sequencing. These are these big panels and we send them when a child has developmental delay or abnormal MRIs or we have concerns. And so our bar for sending these big tests that aren't specific is going down. These tests are getting cheaper and easier to send, particularly in the United States. And so what that is meaning is we're finding a lot of kids that don't even get close to meeting the definition of that pseudo-torch infection, but they can be really mild or Maybe they didn't have trouble walking until they were one and a half, two, four years of age. And so that's what we call the clinical spectrum, right? We started off with this very small view of AGS looks very early and very severe and looks like a congenital infection. And as we start to find families that are affected in different ways, we're finding a really broad range of how it's affecting kids. We're also finding a really broad range of how kids are affected within a single family. And so even within a family, kids aren't affected in exactly the same way. You know, I think one of the things that now we meet a child or a family, we know they have AGS because they're already symptomatic. I think one of our big challenges in the coming years is to be able to predict this. And if you listen to my talk on biomarkers, it's really important to be able to meet a family and understand how it's going to affect their child when you're diagnosing pre-symptomatically. And right now, I don't have great information to meet a child from the newborn screen and be able to predict exactly how that AGS is going to affect them. Because there's such a huge clinical spectrum, it's really hard to predict that. Um, we know that children with AGS can defy expectations and meet new developmental milestones and continue to grow and develop years later than would be predicted by traditional um, development. And then the other thing I'm very interested in studying and better understanding is the connection between the different types of language. And so if you think about receptive language and expressive language, how well a child understands versus how much they can put that information back out into the world. We're finding preliminarily there's a really big disconnect, which is something we all knew, right? 
our kids with AGS are understanding so much more than they can communicate. And I'm interested in better understanding how to both measure that um, and then ultimately unlock that. I think it's important that we offer our kids lots of ways to communicate with us because I think overall we've been historically underestimating how much our kids can do. And so I think our next big stage for AGS is going to be unlocking that and helping to facilitate it because I think our neurologic trajectories are very biased based on what we knew to look for. Um, oh, I have a visitor. This is my cat. <laughs> um, and so, you know, those are the steps that I think we're going to do in the AGS world. I think we're going to better understand in the future how to predict um, how kids are going to do, but also appreciate that there's a big spectrum and having a label doesn't always mean what we think it means. And so I'm always um, interested to explore that more and really make sure I'm keeping an open mind about what the potential is. So um, hopefully you can join me for the question and answer session, and I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have, and we can discuss this further. Thank you.